Oh my God! <laughs> Who touched the broadcast <laughs> button? James. Bur- burritos. Never, <laughs> one, never again. <laughs> me. I did it. Burritos. I did it. Never again. Never again. Burritos. <laughs> yeah, that's how we should start every like pre-show banter. Like when we hit the live, we're like, "Oh my God, I would never tell that story again." Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that was Dude, the... what is that? What is that movie about the joke you can't tell? There's I don't know if we should go there. Yeah, I think there's should. a lot of jokes you can't tell. <laughs> most, most of them, most good ones. All jokes. Okay, <laughs> so I I was asked to do a stand-up show at a high school. And they wanted it to be a clean show. They wanted to like know all my jokes ahead of time. And I was like, I'm not that kind of comedian. And all of a sudden, my brain could only come up with jokes that I could not tell at the high school. Like, that was the <laughs> only thing I could come up with. Don't picture a pink elephant. Don't picture a pink <laughs> elephant. So, so I started doing stand-up of all the jokes I came up with that I could not tell at the high school. And it was two of my best shows. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like, they probably appreciate that if you told all the jokes that you shouldn't be able to tell. I know. If I was yeah. a high schooler, I'd totally, I'd totally be cheering you on. I'd be like, yeah. You'd yeah. never be That's that. what would get him fired. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, have you ever watched The Aristocrats? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that was. All right, let's move on. All right. Yeah, moving right along. Hey, okay. everyone. Hey, everybody. This is pre-show Boy, banter. Welcome to the show. I am Jason Blanchard. Uh, everyone, introduce yourself. I'm the content community director at Black Hills Information Security. Simply because we hate the word marketing. <laughs> it's because we hate the word marketing. Yeah. Hey, who the uh, hell are you, Ryan? Ryan, who, he's the serial killer. <laughs> Psycho killer, run, run away. Uh, he is the shootest. Oh, yeah, I gotta change that. Wait. Me. <laughs> that is a great meme. I'm taking that one right there from RPG Photog. That is Ryan. That RPG Photog is Ryan. I love it. That, my CPU is at 300% now. I just want to point that out. That How is that possible? That I don't know. Possible. <laughs> yeah, what laptop do you, or what computer do you have? I have a MacBook Pro. Like, you know, you'd think the awesomeness of the Mac processor should be able to handle the awesomeness of the GoToWebinar control panel, but... <laughs> How old is it? It's, I mean, <laughs> two years? Yes. Since it, I would have been here for almost two years now, I think. It, you just don't have these problems on Windows, Marcello. Mm. I, I don't have the problem on Mac. <laughs> if this was ever a, a reason to switch to Windows, I'll tell you what, I'm switching tomorrow, like... <laughs> You should probably have two computers, Marcello. You you need them. Well, I, I mean, for work? <laughs> sure, why not? Okay, sure, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll take another. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you're right, CJ. Yeah, I, I really should shut up. I, I yep. do need to take a computer. Yeah. What is your problem, dude? I don't, I, I haven't had my daily dose of OJ yet. I'm still waking up. OJ? That yeah. stuff will kill you. Yeah. That joke? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That beard is getting really impressive. Yeah, I know, right? It's getting David, there. David, show yourself. <laughs> Especially when you cut your hair, it it makes it that much fluffier. I know. It's, so much that, it's the hair. It's the hair that uh that gives everything depth. Once that's if only you were seven feet tall, you'd look exactly like Jabbar. <laughs> I'm gonna have to Google who that is, but oh my uh, God, Marcello! <laughs> um, Jabbar, old, CJ. Oh. Was that with a J? The Johannesburg Inter <laughs> the Johannesburg Interbank average rate. That was this Kareem is- Abdul Jabbar or Jafar. I mean, either one. Not Jafar. Oh, Aladdin? 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 Aladdin guy? Jafar? Yeah, he's got the pointy beard. That's not you. Oh, he's got, oh the pointy beard. Yeah, yeah, the guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you could do Jafar. Yeah. And, wanted, and you wanted to get out of the you wanted to get out of the country and then back in. You better clean it up. 
That, that's actually the plan is to not get back to the states though. So, <laughs> Marcello, I'm, I'm taking you out to dinner next week, and you want to be out of the country. I don't get no, it. no. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be here until at least like another year, and then I'm out. And I'm I'm out of here, man. Are you gonna do Italy? Are you doing South America? What the hell's going? Yeah, South America, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the only it's the only way to go. Like that's the only because it looked cool. I mean. It, there, I mean, it, there's that, but it's also like, it, it, I don't, I mean, ceviche, man. I'll tell you what. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, ceviche. Is that code word for something? Yeah. It's... Oh, my God, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in Baltimore way too long. And even Michigan's uh, helping. I know crab cakes and heroin. That's the two things Baltimore <laughs> known for. <laughs> what about meth? What's wrong with the meth? No, yeah, that's Midwest. Together. Meth is Midwest. Yes, heroin's East Coast. Dude, we got that on lockdown over here in Rapid City. <laughs> <laughs> you got to well, sprinkle some heroin on the crab cake, though. That's what really gives it that extra, extra little <laughs> punch. <laughs> that, yeah, the, the best place in crab Baltimore crab to get crab cakes is also the best place in Baltimore to get heroin. Like, it is literally in the same location. That's convenient. It's called multitasking. Yeah. I see convenience. That's what I see. That's, yeah, we that's... took our, our daughter there to get some crab cakes, and, uh, well, that was a parenting mistake. <laughs> <laughs> she had to use the bathroom, and she's like, yeah. I'm a, my wife took her to the bathroom, and, like, my wife came out, and she's like, there's three people in there shooting up. We need to go. We need to go. We need to go. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to share where this place is so I never go there? Uh, Lexington Market. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah it's uh, Fadley's, I think, is the name of the. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it's it's got a whole bunch of places in there you can eat yeah, and fine. buy heroin. Is that um, near Fells Point? Uh, yeah, you could walk there, mm-hmm. like a really scary walk there. <laughs> <laughs> you if you're wearing a black vest and carrying a shirt, you might make it. You yeah. want to take it, buddy? Don't walk by yourself. <laughs> Someone Those the other the day cops. was like. They were like, I was down at the harbor. It was really nice. But then I started walking left. And I was like, oh, you oh, walked left? No. Like, no. Don't walk left. Stay on the shore. <laughs> not go left. Very, very I was like, that's where they made the wire. Like, the wire <laughs> was made there. Yeah. It's, it's a, based on a true story. It's a lovely city. Come it and visit. Wonderful. Yeah, I, yeah. The crab cakes are amazing. Crab cakes are great. Hey, Ryan, how long is a video turnaround going to take in your estimation? We got a guy who's got God dang work getting in the way of this webcast for him. Uh, for this one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you well, if I put a rush on it, I can do it by tomorrow. Don't be crazy, well, dude. We, we've always <laughs> said a week or two. Wow. I'm promise Ryan. over deliver, okay? Yeah. Right. Next week. For two okay. weeks. <laughs> sure. So about four months from now, I'll definitely find it. Uh, Next year. <laughs> that's that's an right. Italian timeline right there. That's like four months. Yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Camping gear sold out. Go into Walmart. Look at the camping gear aisle. Like mm-hmm. everyone's like, I got to get to the outdoors. I got to get away from people. Everyone's riding bikes. Yeah. Yep. Have you tried buying ammo lately? Like, <laughs> holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing available. I, I just keep buying it a box at a time. My my gun store keeps having nine in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may or may not have bought it in a parking lot at a convenience store. Oh, yeah. <laughs> America. And then we bought it from him. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was totally legal. The guy had a license. <laughs> Pays taxes. Was it the guy that runs the crab cake shack? And, and- <laughs> yes, the guy. <laughs> The same guy. Back, Marcello. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the pre-show banter, everyone. This is not the webcast. The webcast. You're saying that during the webcast there won't be any discussion of meth and crab cakes and <laughs> ammunition. I mean, we try to answer questions, so if that comes up as a question, I sure. <laughs> uh, let us know where you're from in the mm-hmm. Discord channel or in Good Webinar, whichever you prefer. You do not have to use Discord in order to. Uh, participate today. It's just it's uh, it's an easier place for us to drop links. We have a community there of 11,600 people now, so it's a way for you to share your knowledge and learn from others. But you do not have to get a Discord channel. That is correct, and we are not at the threat hunting Discord. We may have set up a couple of Discord channels. <laughs> just a couple. A few. 
We got someone from Rapid City. Uh, Hollywood. Here, how about every time someone says where they're from, we say what the most prolific drug is in that area. <laughs> no. I like this. I like this. Yeah. I, I, I veto that idea. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being the voice of reason. Yeah. Fortunately, it's going to be heroin most of the time, Gosh, I think. Yeah. The... Gosh. <laughs> We have so many discords, they're putting us in folders now. <laughs> you know? Folders? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, now people are just putting the drug of choice in their city. <laughs> <laughs> you did this, Jason. You, you totally did this. Did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Like eight people are like, is this how it is? And they just <laughs> if the Discord admins ever looked at the chat history here, they'd be so confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, remember South Dakota? South Dakota. Meth, we're on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Wait, what? That was, that was a real campaign. Whoever designed that ad needs a raise, I'll tell you what. That, oh, that no, absolutely. Marketing genius. Freaking genius. That got more publicity than anything that they could have ever made. I think, I think we hired somebody in Minnesota, some company over there, like, hey, make us relevant. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh man yeah this is a different different topic <laughs> uh, yeah. maybe we should talk about python <laughs> not, yet. not yet it's too soon it's actually marshall this does go along with the webcast today you created something or spearheaded something called authorware for github and I was trying to explain it to my wife yesterday, and I failed miserably because as she kept asking questions, I was like, oh, I actually, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so sponsor it. So just to clarify, uh, I did not like invent the term. Uh, some guy, oh, I've been made presenter. Oh, thank you. Yeah, show my screen. <laughs> Yeah, in case you want to show GitHub or whatever you want to show. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, show my screen. There you go. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I did not invent the term. Caleb Portio, who is a um, invented this PHP framework off of GitHub, I think sort of started this whole thing. And he got the idea from like a podcast, I think. So I, I definitely did not invent it. But the main idea is that you have, it sort of works like a Patreon where people subscribe and there's X amount of money a month. So $15 in my case a month. And you get access to sponsorware, which is the stuff that's you make that's only available to your sponsors. That's basically it. And then after you reach a certain sponsor goal, so like, hey, I have 60, I want to get like 60 sponsors and I'll release this project after 60 sponsors. So not only is this a good way of making open source sustainable, but it's you make it sustainable in a way where you're still giving back to the community as opposed to making something commercial. Like as opposed yeah. to just going commercial and charging like $10,000 for a license for like a, you know, insert X security product here, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's $15 a month. Uh, it doesn't screw over the, the little guy. Like it, it's, it makes everything sustainable in a way where uh, it, it, it just works. So that's what I did. And I started Porquita Industries, which is a, I'm going to link here to Twitter. So Porquita the Industries has evolved into a community where not only we, we I, I go out and we as a community help other GitHub developers make uh, su successful GitHub sponsorships. So GitHub sponsorships are basically the Patreon of GitHub, right? So it's, a, it's that functionality that allows people to subscribe to you X amount of money a month. So in this community, what we do is we try to help other developers achieve successful GitHub sponsorships so that we can start making this entire process a lot more sustainable as opposed to just working 10,000 hours a year and companies using the stuff without giving anything back. So uh, there's that's that's basically what we're trying to do. Yeah, I definitely saw what you're doing, the community that you're building and the sustainability of it. And I definitely want more people to, to know about it. So we posted the links to those two things. Uh, we got Marcello's GitHub in the slides channel. We got the link to the what you just posted, the community stuff that you're doing. And then the slides channel does have the slides today. So if you go in the slides channel on 
on uh, Discord. I will come up with a solution for GoToWebinar for the slides. Uh, the issue was Marcello used premium grade A memes and GIFs, uh, which <laughs> happened to oh. cause it to be 90 megs in size. And LinkedIn was like, nah, bro. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, only because like it's, it's you, Jason. Only I would have used really crappy ones, but only because it's you, I used the premium <laughs> ones. I appreciate that. Yeah. Grade A premium <laughs> memes and GIFs. <laughs> Hey, Marcello, I had a question about the Patreon thing, or yeah. the Patreon-esque thing. Uh, is there, like, so, you know, a lot of musicians use Patreon, obviously, uh, and it's a great way to feed back to their content development. Yeah. With, with like, uh, open source, obviously, there's a little bit of a different model there where you have contributors. Is there... Uh, any way to like funnel some of that down to the contributors? Yeah, so this is actually a huge logistical issue because I've been I've, I've been debating with another person who has a very successful project as well. And unfortunately, the minute you start getting getting to a point where you're you're diverting actual money to your con contributors, like it, it's 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 an insane amount of overhead. Like it's it's not exactly simple because it doesn't scale. Because you can have, I don't know, like a hundred contributors, right? How are you going to funnel that money? Like everyone would have to give you the, their bank account or something. Like they really it really doesn't really scale. So what we came up with is, I mean, at least I came up with the solution. I don't think there is a right answer to this. Like I really don't. But my solution was okay. Let's go out and actually provide people infrastructure and a platform to make their own sponsorship successful so that they can achieve the same level of whatever you want to call it success in their github sponsorship right for lack of a better term so the, the way i went around doing this is what Purkita industry is trying to do where we're trying to give voice and a platform to other infosec hacking tool developers to actually succeed with their own sponsorships because not a lot of people have like a, a really a lot of twitter following not a lot of people want to be on twitter not a lot of people have a voice to actually spread the word out that hey you know you can actually fund me so i think as a community we can do a better job of that but yeah the, to the question like there really isn't a right answer but the problem is like once you start thinking in that in those terms like you get some of that money and you, and you want to give it out to the contributors like as much as that's great it doesn't scale like that's fine if you have one or two right which is usually the case but but the problem is it doesn't scale that that's the main main concern yeah and you definitely have different levels of effort as as well right so you may have yeah. somebody contributing code all the time or and you may have Correct. somebody you know one feature and and once that feature is satisfied i'm done Correct. Yeah. And that, that's exactly so like MPGN is a perfect example. Of this. He's the guy that uh, basically ported CME to Python 3. Like that was a huge effort. That was absolutely huge effort. And I think uh, there's going to be a, a, a um, uh, from what I understand, there's going to be like a donation being made to the prod to my sponsorship because of crack five exec. So I'm going to be giving half of that donation to him because he absolutely deserves it. And that, that definitely doesn't even amount to the amount of work that he did. But that's a start. Right. But in that, and so in that case, it's easy. But the problem starts becoming, okay, I have a hundred of these people. How the hell am I gonna give money to? Oh, that, that was weird. How the hell am I gonna give money to all of these people, right? So when it's one or two, that's fine. But the, it start, it doesn't scale, unfortunately. So the only way is you have to uplift the people that did contribute to your projects and make their own sponsorship successful. I think that's that's the way to do, go about it. But there really is no right answer. It's a, it's a really weird and interesting problem that I still, I don't think someone has, someone has yet to solve this. I'm not sure if this question is for you, Marcello. It's from Jordan. It said, mm. you mentioned red team hackers. Are you including threat hunters, et cetera? Lots of tools there too. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. This is, this is like every, no, no, no. We're not only like red team focused, like every sort of infosec hacking tool, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, I mean, obviously, Obviously, I'm not gonna like. It has to depend on the tool too, right? Like, if, if it's just like a Python script that shells out to Nmap, 
and just like wraps and map. Okay, we're gonna have to have a conversation here. That's just like a wrap. It's not exactly like something. It's 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 a wrapper, right? So there has to be some sort of conversation about like what tools get it get a channel in the Discord server in the Porqueta Discord server, which is where we're all at, by the way. So if you're on the Porqueta Discord server, you get like a tool channel dedicated for your tool. And the idea is that in the future we'd be able to help you get to a point where you have a successful GitHub sponsorship. So welcome to today's Black Hills Information Security uh, webcast. We have Marcello Salvati. How do you say your last name? Uh, Salvati. Okay. And uh, what do you go by on on the Twitters? Uh, bike leader. Yes, and on Discord as well. And yep. then the rest of the Black Hills team is here today to help answer your questions. Thank you so much for being here. If this is your very first time, welcome. If this is your second or hundredth time, welcome back. Today, Marcello is going to be covering a lot of things about Python. So I'm going to go. We'll talk about this. We'll answer your questions. We have a team on the back end trying to answer your questions inside GoToWebinar, inside Discord. But if we don't get to them, then we'll ask them live, uh, Marcello. Uh, and then at the end, if you stick around, we normally do a rapid fire series of questions for the ones that we couldn't get to. So thanks for being here with us today. If you ever need a pen test, you know where to find us. And I'm out. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about installing Python tools in libraries the right way. This is hopefully going to be a, uh, a series of webinars. This is the first episode where I talk about things that you may or probably may or may not know about the Python language, especially the new versions of the Python language, since a lot has changed, especially since like version 3.7 up. And a lot of features have been added that make life somewhat easier. So uh, hopefully I just get the word out with this series of webinars. And today we're going to be talking about how to actually install tools and libraries the right way, because a lot of pen testers or inform information security professionals deal with Python tools basically on a daily basis. And I, I see a lot of people absolutely frustrated when it comes to de dependency management and just general install hell, general dependency hell, Python version management hell. So hopefully this clarifies a lot and gives you the right way to actually install stuff and a bunch of easy buttons, which we'll get into in a second. So this is what we're going to be tackling today. We're going to be trying to solve, like I said, like a bunch of problems that I see, that like I've seen security professionals encounter on their day to day on their day to day lives with Python tooling or libraries. We're, specifically, what we're going to be covering is how to actually properly manage Python versions on the same system, because a lot of the time, especially when it comes to hacking tools, but and and like open source stuff, a lot of the times, like these some of these tools require specific versions of Python to run, right? So how do you actually go about installing different versions of Python on the same system that you might need and how to actually manage those in a sane way, right? Because sometimes your package, your, your distro's package manager might not have those versions in their repositories, right? We're gonna be trying to also solve my, Pyth the, my Python is broken problem. That if I had a nickel for every time I heard this saying, right? My Python is broken. My Python installation is broken. What does that mean? Why is this actually happening? We're gonna be talking about like disaster that is Python packaging because it is still somewhat of a disaster, but a lot of tools that come out recently uh, that, or that have either come out recently or have been around for a while, it, they just haven't been documented and are properly disseminated within the Python community. We're going to be talking about how you should never, ever, ever cross the streams when it comes to app get and pip, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then we're, I'm going to be sort of your ver the Virgil of the situation and guide you from dependency hell all the way up to heaven. So what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about like what like your your 99% of the problems that you encounter during Python during installing a Python tool. We're going to be covering virtual ends, and then we're going to be talking about the easy buttons to automate a lot of those things. So as the end user, you don't have to deal with. And then we're going to be uh, wrapping up with the conclusions. So just as a disclaimer, this entire presentation webinar, we're going to be focusing on things from a end user's perspective, okay? So these are things that you as an end user can do to make your life easier when it comes to installing Python tools and libraries. 
we're not going to be tackling things from a development perspective. So if you're a Python developer, this isn't you might you you actually might probably find a lot of a lot of this stuff you may or may not know of. You might may not know a lot of this stuff, but it, it won't go into development specific tools such as Pipham for poetry. This is going to be mainly focusing on a end user's perspective who doesn't necessarily have a lot of experience dealing with Python development. So that so this is the perspective that we're going to be taking today. So I'm not going to be delving too deep into uh, Python packaging as a whole. We're just going to be fo again. We're just going to be focusing on like end user perspective. I want to install X tool. How to actually install it properly and not break my entire system as a result? Because incredibly enough, that can happen pretty often, right? So we're going to start at the first circle of hell. First circle of hell when it comes to the, in doing anything with Python is managing Python versions, right? Especially with hacking tools, because sometimes I've uh, there are still a bunch of hacking tools out there that have not been ported to Python 3, and that is a cardinal sin, and, and that's why you're in the first circle of hell. The, you, you should be porting it to port Python 3. However, sometimes the developer just hasn't. I know for a fact, like, I'm beyond guilty of this. Like, for the longest time, CrackMap Exec was imported to Python 3, and thanks to MPG, and now it is. But sometimes it's it's really hard to port the stuff to Python 3, so people just don't do it because they don't have really any incentive to do it. So what happens if you need an old version of Python on a system that doesn't provide you a package, a old version of Python in their in the distros package manager, right? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about, and we're going to be talking about how to actually install different versions of Python on the same system. And it's actually pretty easy, but traditionally. What you'd have to do to actually go out and install different versions of Python on the same system is you'd have to go to python.org, download the source of that version of Python that you need, and compile, manually compile the Python version that you need in order to get it installed. But that doesn't even account for all of the path trickeries that you have to pull to actually get it to work properly, like all the environment variables all the path trickeries that you have to pull to actually make it show up on the command line in the first place. So, you know, survey says, eh, sucks. You know, this is very high on the suck meter. This is, it, it really does suck doing this. So what's the, what's the straightforward solution to this? Thankfully, it's pyenv. So pyenv, this has nothing to do with virtual environments, by the way, although pyenv can manage virtual environments for you. So if you know what virtual environments are, it, this is a completely different thing if you haven't heard about this. So PyEnv is, is a tool that allows you to manage different versions of Python on the same system, okay? It deals with automatically compiling the Python version that you need for you. It manages all of the path and environments uh, settings for you so that you don't have to deal with any of that. It's literally just a few commands to install the Python version that you need and get it to work and make it show up on the command line. and the easy button. Again, this is like an easy button for Python version management, okay? It, on Mac, all you have to do is just brew install pyem. It's pretty simple. If you're on different versions of Nix, you're going to have to install some dependencies through your package manager, and those links at the bottom there at the, of this slide will point you to those, especially the common build problems. It'll just give you an app get command if you're on Debian or whatever package manager you use on your distro to actually install those dependencies. And then it comes with a handy dandy Python installer, uh, pyenv installer, sorry, which is just a bash script which automates installing pyenv, okay? So once you do those two things, that, that's, that's all you really need to do, and now you're completely set. So if you need, for example, in this specific, specific example, Python 3.8.5, right? All you do is pyenv install 3.8.5. It'll go out, grab the source for that version of Python, It'll compile everything for you. Your CPU will spike to three, four hundred percent because it's actually compiling Python in the back end. And then it'll install it to a path. It'll install it to disk, but it'll also set up your path and environment variables for you in order to actually access that Python installation. Okay. So this is exactly what it looks like. So you you just type Python 3, right? And this this is just an example. So to Python 3, we see we have 3.7.7 running right now, right? We then type the command pyenv versions, and there's a little asterisk here, right? You guys can probably see my mouse, but there's a little asterisk here indicating which versions of Python 
you have currently in use. So right now I have the system version, which is 3.7.7, which we, we saw because I actually typed Python 3 before. If you just type PyM versions though, you see all of the versions that uh, you have available to you currently. So these are all the Python versions that we've installed on our system. So I have 3.8.0 all the way up to 8.5, right? So what happens if I wanna switch Python versions? Well, I just type PyM global 3.8.5 and all of a sudden now I'm using Python 3.8.5. It's that simple, that easy, easy button. If I then type Python 3 again, you'll see that now I'm using 3.8.5. So it's literally that simple. This PyM supports basically almost every version of Python known to man. It even supports the weird ones and also like the PyPy, the PyPy ones and the NumPy and all the other versions of Python that you could possibly think of. So it, it literally just covers, this, this is the easiest way of dealing with this problem, especially if you're dealing with tools that require different types of Python versions, okay? So this is, this is really is the easy button. Uh, before I go on, any questions? There are a ton of people having trouble with the audio. The audio is flowing. Of course, if I say that, they can't hear it, but I'm typing it like a madman. Haven't had, I haven't seen a lot of technical questions yet on my side. Okay. Well, you guys can hear me though, right? So. Lots of people, other people have posted up. They're, they're hearing you, so I'm not sure oh, okay. what's going on. All right. Yeah. Good. Awesome. So that's the easy button. Uh, when it comes to Python versioning management, okay? But where you can't go up to, to heaven yet because we need to go down to hell a little bit more because the second circle of Python, uh, uh, the second circle of hell is Python dependencies, okay? So this is by far where 90% of everyone's problems uh, reside, okay? So what well, what do you, like, if you, if you had to describe your process of installing Python tools as of right now, I guarantee most of you do something like this. So you need tool A, you need to install tool A, right? And it's available in my distros package manager. So say you're running Debian, you do app, get, you app cache search, app get app cache search, and then you search for it, it's there, you app get install tool A, done, it's installed, right? Fine, you use it, that's all good and dandy. Now you need tool B, but the problem is tool B is not in your distros package manager, so, but it's on PyPy, so the Python package repository. So what do you do? Well, you just do pip3 install tool B, right? What's the problem? Okay, that's fine. So you use tool B, life goes on, that's normal. But I need tool C, which I previously installed. So tool C was on my, on my system even before I installed tool A and tool B. I need to use tool C now. You try to use tool C and what happens? Tracebacks. Like everything throws up on you. It does, it hates, it hates you. Like it doesn't want to work. Why does this happen? I guarantee you, you've, you've been in this situation. I guarantee at least a few of you have been in this situation multiple times. And how do you go about solving this usually? Well, this is what I call the six stages of Python dependency grief, right? So you have, you wait, you reboot your VM if that, or system. That doesn't work with you revert the VM snapshot. I swear I had this, I had a colleague at one time that he literally had a VM snapshot every single time that he installed a Python tool because it, it like in his entire system would just break every time he tried to install another Python tool and he didn't really understand why, okay? So that's, that's, a, hell of a, that's a hell of a way of going about fixing this problem. You, and then what do you do? You try, to, you try to fix it for a few hours, you get super frustrated, you get high end or drunk because you're just super frustrated and then you give up. This, this sucks, this sucks a lot. There's a handy dandy suck meter there, you see it, it's high, it's in the red zone. How do you make this suck less, right? So this, it really comes down to this, right? Incredibly enough, it really only takes a few steps to actually completely uh, bork up your Python install, quote unquote, because it's not actually Python, it's just dependency hell. With these two easy steps, you app get install some tool, and then you pip install some tool. Okay, or if you just like living on the edge, you can do this. Like if you just like, you know, YOLO in it, you can totally do this, that's fine. But like you literally app get install some tool and then pip install some tool, it's almost guaranteed that you'll break something by doing this, okay? So how do you, so why is that? Well, we're gonna give it back, we're gonna explain that in a second. But just to clarify things, it, do not ever, 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 Use both pack, your package manager and pip to install Python tools libraries. 
you either use one or the other. So you either only use apt or your distros, whatever, you know, Pac-Man or your or whatever the hell your distro calls your package manager. You either use your package manager to install Python tools or you use pip to install Python tools. I'm gonna move the mic out of the way. You don't don't cross the streams. Do not ever cross the streams, only use one or the other. And we're gonna explain this in a sec. But yeah, this I, I've added a spinning thing here because it's it's important. Like this, and I added another one because it's it's doubly important. Do not ever cross the streams here. Use both your package manager. You either use your package manager or pip. Do not ever cross the streams. And this is legitimately the cause of 80% of probably all of the issues that you've encountered when it comes to installing Python tools. And the reason why this happens is this, okay? You app get install tool A, okay? Easy enough. To say tool A requires a certain dependency. In this case, cryptography 1.5. I'm just making up these version numbers, but that this is just an example, right? So say tool A requires cryptography, specifically version 1.5. So the, de the dependency is pinned because anything other than that will, well, it, it'll either there's been breaking API changes in the underlying library. It's been it, there, there's a number of reasons why developers do this, right? But then you pip install tool B, okay? Tool B, say tool B requires cryptography 2.0. Well, pip doesn't really care about the dependency that you pre that was previously installed through your package manager, right? So it's very much the honey badger of of installation tools. It, it'll just overwrite stuff without really understand without like having any concept whatsoever of other things that you've installed through your distros package manager. So if tool B requires cryptography 2.0, it'll overwrite the previous cryptography install. Like it'll it'll just overwrite it. And unbeknownst to you, say there have been breaking API changes between cryptography 1.5 and 2.0. Okay. Or there have been bugs. So there I mean that usually developers have a reason for pinning a specific Depend, uh, version of a dependency, right? So say what happens. So the result of this is that tool A is now broken because you've installed tool B. And also everything else that depends on cryptography 1.5, because there is a reason why the distro is packaged specific dependencies, specific versions of dependencies, because a lot of tools may need specific versions of those dependencies, right? But in this case, the fix is super simple. Just this remove, the cryptography library and reinstall the cryptography library. So reinstall cryptography 1.5. But it, obviously, this can escalate super fast. This is a super simple, simple example where we only have two tools installed. What happens if we have 20 tools installed, right? There is no way of knowing which uh, you, you can't. Well, number one, you can't keep track of changes in dependencies. Like you can't really have an RSS feed and keep track of that manually because you'll just go insane. And two, there really is no good way of finding out which tool, uh, like which tool needs specific, like there's no way of correlating dependencies between tools, if that makes sense, okay? So once you've done this, there is no turning back. Like you either have to just remove everything Python that you've installed and start from scratch bl or blow away your system. And this is exactly why a lot of people have so many problems, okay? So again, I just wanna reiterate this, like do not ever cross the stream. Either use your package manager to install Python tools or use pip to install Python tools or libraries. Do not only use one or the other. Don't use both. Yeah, so, so really you need to just, what if you're way down the stream? The, the, the proper response is go back, blow it all away and just. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, so. You, you can recover like from it by doing some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about in a second, but by using virtual M's and stuff. But if you've been doing this, like it's it's no guarantee that you haven't broken something already, right? So you're going to have to either remove everything that you've installed Python wise, or either blow away your system, which can which for some people it's easy because usually they only install these tools on like disposable VMs. So like Kali, for example, is a perfect example of this, but like, I just want to emphasize that you, you you do not ever cross the streams here. Either use app get or pip. Do not use both. Okay, don't. Yeah, that, that's that's the important thing. But you can somewhat get around all of the dependency hell that you've caused because by doing this using virtual ems and other tools that I'm going to be talking about in a second.
Okay, so sometimes it, this happening is unavoidable and is not always your fault, right? Because you wind up installing like sometimes automation scripts, right? Sometimes I don't know, you install a specific tool and it uh, you don't know that it's actually running pip or app get in the background to install specific python dependencies. Like it's not always your fault, right? Sometimes this can happen without you knowing. So how do how do you go about actually changing how do you go about actually dealing with this second layer of hell right the second circle of hell well you just isolate everything it's a pretty simple concept right you isolate every tool in its own little environment so that they it doesn't all the tools don't mess with each other's dependencies so you isolate dependencies of each tool and library how do you do this virtual ms okay virtual environments now this this term confuses a lot of people the, this is not a container okay this is not a ver vm this is essentially just a bunch of environment variable and path trickeries to in order to make python uh, understand that there are different environments okay so it's a very lightweight system this is not a container you can sort of think of it as a container but it's 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 definitely not it doesn't involve any like permissions or C groups or anything. It's all environment variables, okay? So it's just basically a way of telling Python, hey, I want you to take these things and install them in their own separate depend in their own separate folder on the file system and uh, act as if it's its own clean environment. okay? So it's an isolated way of it's a way of creating isolated installing isolated tools and dependencies, okay? And yeah, I added another spinning thing there because why not? So, what are virtual M's? This is directly from the uh, Python documentation. So again, they're just a way of creating lightweight virtual environments with their own site directories, optionally isolated from system site directories. So that's just Python speak for saying they're, the, everything that you install in a virtual environment has its own folder away from the system packages that get installed through app get or pip. Okay, so that, that's just that Python speak for that. And each virtual environment has its own Python binary. So it basically symlinks the Python binary. So whatever Python version you're using, excuse me, it symlinks that version in the folder itself so that your the virtual environment uses that version of Python. So this another thing that's confusing, and I still can't believe this was the case. For the longest time, this functionality wasn't available by default when you install Python. It was a third party tool that you had to download virtual env and virtual env wrapper for you know for, for the for the Python developers that are listening. It was a third party tool that you had to download and install to actually get this functionality, which was absolutely mind boggling. I have no clue why this was included as late as 3.3, only as late as version 3.3 of Python. But thankfully now it's included by default, and you really shouldn't be using anything less than 3.7 at this point, or 3.6 if you really want to push it uh, for a lot of reasons. But suffice it to say, there is a VM module included with Python now, starting with version 3.3. Okay, so you you don't have to install anything else; it comes with Python itself. So how do you actually go about creating a virtual environment? Okay, so all you do is th this is this is what a typical work development workflow looks like, but you can do this when actually installing when actually installing a tool. So say you git clone the tool, right? My awesome project. You CD into my awesome project, and then you use the VM module, which is what we're doing on this line right here, right? So Python 3-M, the dash M it indicates that you want to execute a Python module. So Python itself comes with a bunch of modules, quote unquote which are just uh, uh, easy access functionality to a lot of Python internal libraries. So like, for example, there's a JSON tool lib module, Python module, which allows you to pretty print JSON, which is super handy. There is the HTTP server module. So that's probably something that a lot of pen testers or bread teamers are, are familiar with that quickly spins up an HTTP server. That is a Python module. So there, there are a bunch of them. One of them is the virtual environment module, right? So this is a virtual environment module. So we're, at, we're running, we're gonna be running that. And then the only argument that it takes is the path to the folder that you wanna put all of your dependencies in. That, that's all it takes. And if it doesn't exist, it'll create it for you. So 
we're creating a hidden directory here in um, the my awesome project folder my awesome project vm okay and that's where python is going to set up all the things that it needs to actually create a virtual environment right we then install we then sorry we then source the activate bash script okay so when you run this module this with the, the vm module in python it will actually place a bunch of bash scripts in the bin directory in whatever the folder that you specify okay and one of these is the activate bash script okay this bash script is what actually activates the virtual environment so you then source that file so you just give the source command you point it to the activate bash script that's already there and you'll see that you pr your prompt will change so your prompt now looks something like this so you have this um the the name of the virtual environment in parentheses at the start of your prompt and this is what tells you that you're now in a virtual environment and everything you do from here on out gets python wise at least gets installed in that virtual environment okay so if you see this 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 little um thing in parentheses at the beginning of your prompt that means you're in a virtual environment and now if you do pip install requests for example that request library will get installed in its own little isolated environment, and you won't have to worry about a dependency hell and going all the way to the Malabolgia down there, all the way, all the way down to the hell, straight, straight to hell, like in the, uh, when it comes to dependencies. Okay, you won't have to deal with anything about that because everything gets installed in its own little environment. Okay, and all you do to to get out of this virtual environment is you type deactivate. There's a deactivate command that gets put into your terminal or you can hit control d and it, you'll see this little thing at the beginning of the prompt disappear and that means you're out of the virtual environment and you can continue on with your day okay so that that's what it that's what creating virtual environments is like in practice however for the end user and that's not what i wanted to do let's try that again okay for the end user this is a lot of finger mileage right if you have to do this for every single tool that you have to install like this is a pain. Virtual environments are mainly used for are, are mainly meant for developers, especially setting them up manually like that. That's very much a developer. You you only really do that if you're trying to hack on the source code or or like add functionality to an existing project or start a new project, right? For the end user, that's a lot of finger mile, finger mileage. Well, thankfully there's this tool called pipx. Pipx is essentially pip. So the normal pip you all know and love only that it takes care of installing everything you do with it in its own virtual environment. So it completely automates this entire process right here, right? This entire process right here gets completely automated and abstracted away by PipX. So another thing to understand is that uh, this is specifically meant for application, for application, for Python applications that expose some type of command line tool. It's not meant for libraries. And this is because it, it installs things in its own separate environments. But it's extremely useful for any Python package that exposes some sort of command line tool. So say crack map exec for a CME, for example. This is a perfect example of this. It exposes the CME command line tool, right? You can use pipx to install CME without having to worry about polluting your system site packages and creating dependency hell for you. So it's essentially the the same thing as pip only that it installs everything in isolated environments for you okay this is again not meant for libraries so a perfect example of this unless things have changed from the last time i took a look at the uh, impacket uh, python package if you do pipx install impacket for example you're not going to see any of the example scripts so like secrets dump or uh, all of the other tools like uh, all the other tools that Impacket exposes, you're not going to see those available to you as a command line because in, on the command line because Impacket doesn't expose those scripts as as command line tools. Impacket is mainly a library. Those example scripts are mainly are examples that that you can use to that show you how to actually use the library. Okay, so this is meant for Python packages that expose command line tools, not Python libraries. Okay. But most of the time as an end user, you're not installing libraries anyway, you're installing tools. So it doesn't really matter. So this is exactly what you need. So in practice, what, this, what does this look like? You use the pip module 
to install Python 3, okay? Not Python 3, sorry. Use the pip module to install pip pipx, my bad. And then after you install pipx, all you do is type the command pipx ensure path, okay? And this, what this does is it sets up your path environment variable and a lot of other environment variables in a way where it can expose any of those Python package command line scripts to you directly to your command line, okay? So after we do pipx ensure path, we have everything we need. We can now start installing whatever we want. So in this case, I'm installing pycause, which is just like cause only in Python you know, in Python. So pipx, pipx install pycause. It goes out and installs that Python package in its own isolated virtual environment, okay? So anything that we install with pipx will not get us in dependency hell because all of these tools have their own virtual environment. They're isolated, nicely put away. So you don't have to deal with any dependency hell, okay? But on top of that, like I said before, it exposes that the whatever command line tool the Python package comes with. So in this case, the pycause Python package exposes the pycause cli tool, okay? And we have that available now in our terminal. If we actually type out pycause and then you give it an argument of whatever you want to, the cow, whatever you want to make the cow say, you'll see that it just works as expected, okay? So this is, again, like for the end user, a easy button, you know, smash that easy button, right? For installing tools without having to completely destroy your system site packages, worry about dependency hell. And now that you know about PyEnv, not only can you manage Python, different Python versions in a sane way, but now you can manage Python tools in a sane way without having to worry about uh, completely borking everything up, okay? But sometimes that's not enough, right? Because a lot of, uh, a lot of testers run into this situation, a lot of uh, even even blue team folks like everybody runs into a, some some situation where they're in where like you need something like this okay so you need to make sometimes you need to make python apps somewhat portable and i say semi portable here for a reason but let's take an example uh, say i have tool a installed on machine a with all of its dependencies nicely isolated okay so i use pipx i'm all set I know the right way of doing things now. I've installed this tool on my own machine. It works, it's perfect, right? But say I wanna take that same tool and run it on machine B. But the thing is, I really don't wanna install it in a virtual env and or I just don't wanna use pipx because that it's still a little bit of finger mileage. I'm super lazy, I'm feeling super lazy today. Still a little finger mileage in order to do those things. I don't wanna do with any of that. But at the same time, I want to run tool A on machine B without having it completely bork up its Python installation, right? I don't, I don't want other things to break on machine B by polluting the system site packages, right? So how do I do that? One thing to note here is that in order for what I'm about to tell you, in order for to actually from what I'm about to tell you to work, you, the machine B needs to have a compatible Python version installed, okay? So this is exactly why I say semi-portable. Because machine B in this, in this situation has a compatible version of Python already installed. You just want to take tool A and run it on machine B without having to worry about dependency, system side package pollution or dependency, dependency help, okay? Can you accomplish this? Yes, you can. And this is one of those pretty little Python secrets that not all people know about. And a matter of fact, I just discovered this myself and I've been developing in Python for like almost 10 years now at this point, over 10 years at this point. I just discovered this myself at the beginning of the, uh, like, I think the beginning of last year, if I remember, but super recently, I forget. I've been in quarantine for six months. Time is, doesn't even matter anymore. So you go, if you go to that link that I have in this slide, you'll, you'll see all the documentation regarding zip apps. What are zip apps? They're basically the equivalent of jar files in the Python world, okay? So Java has jar files, Python has zip apps. Same exact thing, same exact concepts. So zip apps by convention, instead of having the jar file, the, that jar extension, they have the PyYZ extension. So if you come across a file that's a PyYZ, that's a zip app. But it really is just a zip file. If you can unzip it with a normal zip utility. This functionality has existed since Python 2.7, but 
And so it's been a, it's been in Python for a long time. However, it was somewhat badly documented and somewhat hidden. It's only been much better documented, and it actually made somewhat popular recently as of Python 3.3. 3, Python 3.3 seems to be the magic number for a lot of this stuff. So, but that's why you may or may not have heard of this. But essentially, what this allows you to do is exactly is do exactly what i described in the previous situation right so it allows you to pack, package up a python app put it in a zip file with all of its dependencies and run it in an isolated manner that's exactly what it is so you can it makes python applications semi-portable same thing with it's the, again the equivalent of jar files in java so if you dealt with java uh, jar files the same exact thing with with zip apps okay so how do you go about creating a zip app there's awesome documentation about this now so in the application folder that you're going to package up, you just run these commands. So you just do first. What you do is you actually install the dependencies of the application that you want to turn into a zip app into its own folder. Okay. So in this case, we have a my app folder. We're going to take all of the requirements. So the requirements that txt, if you're not familiar, is a file that contains all, is used by convention contains all of the Python dependencies for your application. Okay, so we're basically telling pip to install all of the dependencies defined in our requirements.txt file and put it in that my app folder. Okay, we're then taking a zip app, the zip, the Python module zip app, right? Because we're using that dash m flag again, the, which is a Python module, by the way, and we're giving it the dash p argument, which specifies the interpreter to use. OK, so this is just a normal shebang line. So this actually tells this actually appends the shebang line at the beginning of that zip file in order for the system where you run it on to know what Python interpreter to use to actually run the zip app. OK. And then you give it the entry point of your application, which in this case is my app main. Right. So you have a main file. You have a under, under main file. Right and you have a main function in there that's the entry point of the application and that's what's going to get run when you actually run the zip app okay the end result of this is it'll produce a standalone executable which is sort of a i wish they changed that because it's a misnomer it's not a it's not an actual binary executable it's a zip file it's a it's a jar it's the equivalent of a jar file which can be run on any machine with the appropriate interpreter available so again the caveat to this is that you need to have an, a, a the a compatible version of python already installed okay it's not a standalone executable it's not truly standalone executable okay because it doesn't bring the python interpreter with it it just packages up the application you can then just run the applicate the zip app itself with python you just give it to the python interpreter and it'll just run it okay it's that easy or you can just shimod it give it the set the executable bit and just run it like a standard uh, executable so that's easy peasy magic right this is this is what we want. We want things that are somewhat easy. So we want a way of port, uh, making applications somewhat portable. Zip apps are the way to go. Before I continue, are there any questions? Well, geez, thanks for taking a breath, Marcello. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get, I get frustrated when it comes to this. But, yeah. <laughs> are there any questions? Um, which do you prefer, PIP or Package Manager as your default? So actually, I, I stopped using like pack, uh, package managers or pip completely for installing any Python tools. I just use pipx. Like that's pipx. I just the first things that I do is I literally just do pip install pipx and just use pipx for everything. In my case, since I, I I do develop a lot of Python, I tend to use development tools, which again we're not going to be talking about in this presentation because it's not meant for it's not meant for developers. It's meant for end users, but so like stuff like pipm or poetry. Uh, I personally use poetry because it's much saner and it takes care of everything basically. But yeah, no, I I stopped using package managers and or pip completely, and I just use pipx. And then I'm not sure if you covered it. A lot of people asking for like pipenv, like what's the difference between that and pipx and. So yeah, so that's a really good question. So pipenv is a tool primarily meant for developers. Okay, so pipenv is a tool that does manage virtual environments for you, but it, it's it, it's meant in a development setting. 
So if, if you're trying to set up a development environment to hack on the source code of a Python application or create a new project, you'd use pipemd in that case because not only does it manage the creation of virtual environments, but it also manages dependency pinning and uh, dependency management. It, it manages dependencies. So like, say you need like mm. cryptography version 1.5, it's a separate use case. It's not, it's meant for develop. Pipemd and Poetry are meant for developers. It's, so that it, sounds like this follow on question. What happens if two tools require different versions of a dependency? Pipm sounds like that helps handle that. Correct. Yeah, but again, yeah. like Pipm, yeah. yeah, it does help handle that. But it, that's again, that's meant for developers mainly, right? Yeah. We're not. Yeah, this is. It's not exactly meant for end users. You, but then, Pipm is simple enough that end. Yeah, sorry. Pipm is simple enough that it's. It is. You end users can use it, but there is some required background knowledge that you need in order to make it work right. Got it. And then some people are saying, any thoughts on using Docker containers to deal with this issue? Yeah, and I'm going to be talking about that at the end of this. Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. That's, um, that's definitely something that definitely you can do. It's not lightweight, but it's definitely an easy button. Uh, so I added it to this. Awesome. And for the audience out there, there's like one bazillion questions. I'm trying to keep up as best I can. Sorry. OK, do you have a couple more before I go? No, I, I used up my little uh, my little queue. I got to go back and build another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, so we talked about zip apps. We now know what zip apps are, and what is this? Hold on a second. What just happened? Okay, to go away. Oh no. Ah, okay. So we talked about zip apps. So there are some gotchas with using zip apps because if we made things too easy. <laughs> This is one of the, one of my biggest gripes with Python uh, development and package management. It's just beyond uh, it's just beyond horrendous. If we made things too easy, that would be hard, right? We have to add gotchas in there somewhere. But one of the gotchas with zip apps is that they will not work with anything that has C extensions. Okay. So what are C extensions for those who are not familiar with this? C extensions are basically a ways are basically well, as you probably can guess by the name, they're extensions written in C that you can interface with Python, okay? So say you have a part of an application that's super computationally expensive, okay? Like, I don't know, Fibonacci sequences or whatever the, like zipping up folders, for example, that's, that's pretty computationally expensive, right? And you wanna make that faster. You can write a C extension. For example, the cryptography library, which I've been talking about a lot for some reason during this presentation, that has, a, that has a lot of C extensions because a lot of these cryptographical operations are computationally expensive, right? So if you try to package up anything, if you try to package up an application that has C extensions or an application that depends on a library that has C extensions, it'll just, and you try to package that up in a zip app, it'll just throw up on you. When you try to run it, it'll be like, I, I, I was looking for the C extension. I can't find it. What's up? Uh, help me out. It'll, it just won't work. And unfortunately, most useful libraries, especially when it comes to pen testing and, lib and red teaming, and or on, even on the blue side, right? Because on the purple side as well, whatever color the rainbow, the rainbow you choose to be on. It, it, a lot of these libraries do have C extensions because they make things a lot faster, right? For example, Impacket is a perfect example of this. Like if you try to zip up a, a if you try to make Impacket a zip app, It'll just it won't work because it depends on PyCryptodome X, which is a which is a cryptograph another cryptography library, which has C extensions. Okay, so unfortunately that's a gotcha. Now, how do we go about solving this? Because obviously this is a really interesting thing to have, right? I, I would like this to work with basically everything. Well, thankfully the people over at LinkedIn made something called Shiv. So Shiv is nothing more than a slightly modified version of the Python zip app module, okay? And it's specifically designed so that it makes zip apps work with C extensions, okay? Now the way it does this is it puts, it just spools the entire contents of the zip file to disk. Because another interesting fact about zip apps is that Python zip apps run completely in memory, <laughs> which is actually somewhat of like an interesting thing from a 
Red Team Tradecraft perspective. If you actually execute, you can actually filelessly execute Python zip apps, which is amazing. So all of the, so by default, zip apps run completely in memory. With Shiv, however, it sort of modifies the zip app module so that it spools everything to disk, which makes C extensions happy because C is not made, anything written in C is really not made to be executed from memory. And if you don't have the right libraries, and if you can't find the right libraries to load, it'll just throw up on you, okay? So the way it does this is it'll just take all the contents of the zip app you created with Shiv and spool it to a .shiv folder in your home directory, okay? So that's a really easy way of solving this problem. So, but unfortunately, one of the consequences of making something compatible with C extensions is that if you create a zip app with Shiv, those zip apps are not guaranteed to be cross compatible with other architectures because it obviously has to compile the C extensions in the back end, right? In order to make, in order to make them work. So this can be solved pretty easily with CI/CD pipelines. So especially with GitHub Actions now, that like GitHub Actions is a thing. All you really need to do is just make sure you create Shiv applications on different versions of operating systems that GitHub Actions provides. So, and I'm going to show you an example of this in a second. But like uh, Sign Trinity and CME, for example, uh, all have GitHub Actions that create Shiv applications on macOS, on Debian. And I think there's another one there too, which I forget. So this way you have three shift binaries, which will probably cover 90% of where people are going to be running your application on. Okay. So it's not that big of a deal in the, in the end. So like I said before, Sonatra and CME are available as shiv, uh, shiv zip apps, for lack of a better way of calling these. And this is directly from the make file. So there's a make file. Uh, I, I actually do use make files in Python applications. They actually do come in handy. So this is the build entry in the make file. So all it's really doing is it, it's creating a build and a bin directory, right? It's copying the Silent Trinity source code to the build directory. It's then using pip install to install all of Silent Trinity's dependencies in the build folder, right? It's then getting rid of a bunch of crufts left over from installing uh, those dependencies, a bunch of stuff that we don't need packaged up in the application. And then it's using the shiv applicate, the shiv binary that you have available to you when install shiv to actually package up all of the requirements, all the dependencies that it needs. It's telling it to compress it. It's giving it other arguments because Silent Trinity spins up listeners in different processes. So SHIB needs to be aware of that in order to make things work. That's what the dash uppercase E and lowercase, the dash uppercase E is for, excuse me. And then it's telling SHIB to actually define the entry point to the application to the run function in the Dunder main folder there. And then it's telling it to out create the actual zip app called st and output it to the bin directory. And it's also setting that shebang line. So wherever you run this, wherever you decide to run Silent Trinity, it automatically picks up the appropriate version of Python that it needs, okay? So this is a example of creating a zip app with shiv. The great thing about this is again, that it'll just work with everything. It doesn't matter what you library requires, doesn't matter, it'll just work with everything. Doesn't matter if you need C extension, doesn't matter, if it needs R extensions, doesn't matter if it needs whatever extension you, you want, it'll just work. Again, easy button for making apps semi-portable. Are there any questions before I continue? Yes, sir, I do have some. Thoughts on Anaconda? Some other people thought that Anaconda was solving some of these kind of issues. You know, I actually never looked into Anaconda. I would have to I would have to look that up. I've never had to deal with that, so I don't, I don't know to be honest. I'm not sure what Impacket. Someone says, "How do you recommend install Impacket on a system?" Is that relevant? Yeah, yeah, it is. So, like, yeah, that's an interesting question because unfortunately, it's there's no easy button for that because it's mainly a library, and those example scripts don't get exposed. So, unfortunately, the real only way to do this sanely is to install it in a virtual environment. You'd have to manually create a virtual environment, which 
you can either use the method I outlined before, so the the built-in virtual env module in Python, or you can use something like pipenv or poetry to actually do that, which makes which automates that process and makes it a little bit easier. But I'm not going to be covering that because that's just a whole other rabbit hole. Got it. Ahead. But yeah. but a place to investigate. Yeah. Uh, from a non-developer perspective, so looking for an easy button. What yeah. would be the happy path to deal with all this? What's the easy button, simple? Yeah, the easy button is PipX. Like, the easy button really is PipX. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely recommend PipX. I wouldn't use anything else with the exception of Docker, unless, like, the situation that I talked about before where you need to get it to run on another machine, which you probably want to use Zip apps for that, or you just install PipX on that machine. Pipex, just just you, the answer really comes down to Pipex from users or Docker, which I'm going to explain in a second. Cool. And then, uh, what if I what if I want to automate installation of tools? What's the way to go? Okay, so that's an <laughs> yeah, that's okay. So so there are there are tools that other tools that do that. So there are tools that automate installing tools for you. I'm not going to name ones because they're all broken in my mind. <laughs> there are a lot of frameworks out there which install tools from GitHub, right? However, the way they do it is completely, it, like there's no regard to dependency help. Like there's apps, so it installs everything into your system side packages when it comes to Python. It doesn't, it doesn't take into consideration dependency held. It, it'll, I guarantee you if you use those, those tools that install other tools, for lack of a better term, it will break your system. Um, so unless you don't care about the system you're installing the tools on, which is a, a pretty common use case, I wouldn't use those. I wouldn't use those. There isn't, as of my knowledge, there really isn't a, a tool that install other tools that does it in the same way and that's actually a thing that I'm working on. That, that is actually a project that I have in mind, although I need the time in order to actually make that happen. Awesome. Plunge on. Okay. So finally, if all else fails, Docker. So Docker is amazing. You can quickly create isolated Python environments using Docker. And it's, again, like an easy button for end users. It isn't exactly lightweight. Like, it... it it comes down because what happens is if you start creating a lot of Docker containers for every single application, it, it like you can wind up with 15 gigabytes worth of Python tools and Docker images really fast. Okay, so like it, it depends, but it, Docker does make it super easy. So there is that. It's not exactly lightweight, but it is super easy, which is why I usually recommend Pipex because it just takes care of. 90% of the use case, but if you really want to use Docker, you totally can, and that's fine. There are some gotchas when it comes to Python, so when it comes to packaging anything in Docker or using Docker to actually create isolated environments or actually build Python applications, right? So another uh, common misconception that I was actually not aware of until recently Azure, uh, as well is that People usually tell you that the Alpine base image is the best because it produces smaller images. The problem is that's mainly for Go. Python is not Go. It's a different language. And that is not the case for Python. You're going to want to always stick with the Debian-based Python 3 images. So either the, latest, the Python latest tag on Docker Hub or the Slim Buster as a Python 3.8 slim buster as a writing. Obviously, that tag will change as Python versions increase or uh, new versions of Debian uh, come out. But like you're gonna always want to stick with the Debian ver Debian based Python 3 Docker images. And the reason for that are Python wheels, which we're not gonna get into. We're not gonna get into rather. But essentially, Python wheels are a way for you to install libraries that come with C extensions. And I should put that down. With that come with C extensions without actually having to compile them. So if a Python wheel detect, this is super, this is abhorrently explained, but it gets the point across. Uh, if a Python wheel detects that you're running a certain Linux distribution, right, that it has a Python wheel for, 
and it, it'll it won't have to compile those C extensions. Okay. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the way you look at it, there are a lot of Python wheels for Debian. There are exactly zero Python wheels for Alpine. So the consequences of this is it's going if you install libraries or tools that have any C extensions on Alpine Linux, it's going to have to compile those C extensions for every single library that you install, which takes forever and produces bigger images than if you were to just install the Debian, if you were to just install the wheel, okay, on Debian. So that's something to keep in mind. And also, I just want to point out this amazing resource, pythonspeed.com slash docker. This is basically, at this point, the Bible when it comes to packaging Python apps in Docker. It really is. Like It, it has basically it, almost everything that you'd ever want to know about uh, packaging applications in Docker. So I wholeheartedly recommend it. But again, like if you are going to set up Docker environments that package app, Python applications in Docker, you're going to want to stick with the Python Python uh, images based on Debian. Okay. So in practice, what does this look like? You git clone a tool. So you git clone my awesome tool, right, from GitHub. You CD into the application. You pull down the latest version of Python. Latest version is fine. You're not, you, you basically just want to create a disposable environment. Like the use case here is you're creating a disposable environment that in order to not actually create dependency hell, right? So you pull down the latest Python image. You then use do the Docker run command to actually execute, uh, I forgot the entry point. Our command line argument in here, but you basically run, uh, use the Docker run command, you specify the dash V flag, which will expose, in this case, your current directory in the Docker container itself to the slash my app directory. So your the, the application code that you just get cloned will be available in the Docker container under the slash my app directory, okay? You then specify dash IT, which will basically uh, make the terminal interactive. And you then give it the image ID of the Python image that you just pulled down. And then you specify the entry point as bin bash. And the result of this is that you will be dropped into a bash shell, right? In the Docker container, your application code will be in my app. And then you can pip install to your heart's content as you usually would, okay? So, and you, you don't have to care about dependency hell because you're in a disposable Docker container now. So you can just pip install, app get install, doesn't really matter. You won't break your base OS system because you're in a separate Docker container. It, it'll just be isolated. It'll be all nice and fine. So that's good. You're good to go there. Okay, so, and, and again, like the end goal of this is that you, you're, you're dropped into a bash prompt and you'll have a completely isolated environment and you can just pip install and app get to your heart's content. You won't break anything, okay? And that comes to the end of this. And hopefully, I didn't I didn't finish that early. Ah, perfect, right on time. <laughs> Two whole minutes, brother. Yeah, yeah, right on time. So conclusion, Python packaging is still a nightmare. I'm not gonna lie, it really is still a nightmare. However, there are a bunch of tools that have come out recently that make it easier and it's getting better, it really is getting better. So kudos to the whole Python development team to actually making it better, okay? And this is essentially a compilation of things that I wish someone would have told me about plus 10 years ago when I actually started developing in Python. And hopefully it makes your life easier. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, for the you questioners out there, lots of specific questions and obviously we can't get to all of them. We're gonna hang out after we kill the, the video here and try to answer some. So if you've got some out there, we'll, we'll keep trying. I tend to work from the bottom of the list Please don't spam me by posting your questions 20 times, just a couple out of you, if I can catch them. But I think that's it. Jason, you want to take us out? Or Deb the Deb, who is on mute and I can't hear you? Yeah, Deb's on mute. Hey, Deb. Your lips are moving. Your lips are moving. Can't hear you. Can't, no, no, I can't hear you. If it was Marcello, we wouldn't be able to tell your lips are moving. Somebody said that you need to shave your beard, Marcello, so we could see that you were talking. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. This is this is 
All right. Well, I'm going to take over for Deb. Deb said, hey, thanks so much for coming. We appreciate you all. Stay tuned for future webcasts and hang out for the after show banter.